Known for its watchmaking talent, its architecture and science, Besançon exercises a strong attraction. Climbing the slopes which lead to the citadel of Vauban, the city shelters in a curve in the River Doubs. Here, the Franche-Comté and its neighbours enjoy a rewarding exchange of ingenuity. Not long after the revolution, Besançon welcomed hundreds of Swiss watchmakers, thus becoming the capital of French watchmaking. Le Roi, one of the most prestigious brands from Paris, succumbed to the charm of Besançon and established a base here at the end of the 19th century. Today, Le Roi has returned to the city on the river. The saga of Le Roy began during the Enlightenment. In 1747, young Basil Le Roy was apprenticed to a Parisian master clockmaker. Later, his son Charles opened a workshop and boutique at the Royal Palace in 1785, giving birth to the Le Roy label. Under the reign of terror after the 1789 revolution, this name became problematic and former purveyors to the king were threatened. Princely watches were born in the workshops of the royal palace in the Gallery of Equality. Maritime powers of the 18th century were keenly interested in the development of marine chronometers. These meticulous guardians of time were used to establish one's exact position on the seas. Shipwrecks were a looming threat. Determining latitude was not a problem. To do so, seamen had been using instruments such as the astrolabe and later the sextant since ancient times. But these methods could not ascertain longitude, which required observing the difference between the hour of the sun's zenith in the middle of the ocean and noon at Greenwich. This disparity between the boat and the reference meridian indicated the longitude. For this task, a trustworthy timepiece was needed on board, one which would still reflect the correct hour of the home port despite shocks, waves and changes in humidity. An error of one second would throw off the estimated position by 500 meters. Any imprecision could put the ship in danger, leading it to wreck against a reef, which one thought was elsewhere. The technological challenge was commensurate with the other strategic issues of the day. The British authorities pledged a handsome sum to whoever created the best marine chronometer. It was finally awarded in 1773 to John Harrison, a clockmaker who had spent most of his life on the project. Henceforth, all fleets equipped their ships with increasingly efficient chronometers. Le Roy was an important supplier to the military and merchant marines of several nations. In 1950, Le Roy introduced the Chronosat series, marine chronometers based on electric impulses and transistors. These were replaced in the 1980s by atomic timepieces. Today we rely on GPS time, but when electronics fail, there always remains the sextant and the precision chronometer. Stop. In the 19th century, the king's clockmaker became that of the emperor, of his family, and of all the courts of Europe. Pocket watches were ever more complex and delicately carved, while the so-called officer's pendulum accompanied every voyage.
national exhibitions all over Europe, showered praises on a brand whose reputation increased while others fell behind. Leroy and Sons employed some 50 workers in their Paris workshops, opened a shop in London, and even became official watchmakers to Queen Victoria, a significant distinction for a French firm. Many famous people could be found amongst their customers. Chopin, Debussy, Proust, and later Saint-Exupéry and even Roosevelt all wore a Leroy watch. At the end of the 19th century, the firm decided to move to Besançon, a strategic choice as the city was close to its Swiss suppliers and now possessed an astronomical observatory with which Leroy would henceforth work closely. The latest scientific tools were sought by nations aiming to measure time with great precision without allowing it to drift off course. Networks were established to ensure that time could be measured accurately, compared and confirmed. In the 1880s, the observatory of Besançon was built with the goal of helping the watch industry in its quest for precision. Astronomers meticulously checked the reliability of timepieces and awarded a certificate of chronometry. In order to grant the certificate, reference clocks were needed, clocks whose precision must be constantly checked against the movement of the stars. The preferred instrument at the end of the 19th century was the meridian circle. Installed in a building with an open roof, it was oriented on an exact north-south axis to scrutinize the sky at the meridian which all celestial bodies would cross. By noting the precise instant of this transition and the altitude of the star, astronomers could determine its exact position. The data was systematically collected and compared with the astronomical tables which catalogued the stars. Leroy's most impressive historical contribution was the much admired Leroy 01. It received the Grand Prix at the Paris World's Fair in 1900 for being the most complicated timepiece in the world. The story of this timepiece is like a novel with recurring plot twists. A first edition with 11 complications was made for the Russian Count Nicholas Nostitz. On his death, it was acquired by Antonio Augusto Cavallo Monteiro, a great Portuguese collector. He asked Leroy to refine the mechanism and the decoration such that it would surpass all other timepieces. Watchmakers from the Jew Valley therefore created a mechanical masterpiece possessed of 25 complications. Completed at Besançon, the timepiece excited universal enthusiasm. It was worth a fortune and to facilitate its passage through customs, Louis Leroy entrusted it to the King of Portugal in person, himself a client of Leroy and presently visiting France. He would take the watch in his personal luggage and hand it over to the Portuguese purchaser. Fifty years later, the Leroy 01 was restored to France thanks to a public subscription and is today a leading exhibit at the Time Museum in Besançon. Built for the 1889 World's Fair, the Eiffel Tower symbolized the extraordinary flourishing of sciences and technology in which Leroy was an active participant. The tower was also an antenna, which would play a crucial role in wireless telegraphs, radio, and for the first time, the broadcast by radio telegraphy of a time signal. Leroy developed the pendulum clockworks upon which the whole system depended. These centuries of time were encased deep in the earth to avoid disturbing vibrations. They were precise to one hundredth of a second, 
and would soon equip astronomical observatories the world over. The consistently excellent results obtained by Le Roi watchers in chronometry competitions throughout the 20th century ensured a significant international clientele, both civil and military, in aeronautics, navies and sports. This reputation was not, however, confined to their Besançon factories. The Jura forms a crescent in which the watchmakers of the Neuchâtel Mountains and the Jou Valley were traditionally celebrated for creating the most precise and complicated watches. These would then be decorated and commercialized by important brand names with showrooms in Geneva or Paris. Throughout its history, Le Roi has maintained close and fruitful relations with the Jura. It has been said of the Le Roi 01 that it had a Swiss mother and a French father. The epithet is still valid. Today, the Le Roi factory reposes upon these two solidly anchored pillars, the Jou Valley and Besançon. And yet, the industry has suffered a severe economic crisis since the 1970s, and one might have expected watchmaking in Besançon to decline and disappear by the end of the 20th century. It proved to be only an eclipse. Two thousand and ten saw the return of Le Roi to the capital of the Franche Comté, with the inauguration of its new premises near the observatory and a long term commitment the firm will place all of its historical collection in the Time Museum in the Grand Velle Palace. Besançon and Le Roy are united by both heart and reason. Their close links mark the renaissance of a great brand and announce a time of excellence. <laughs>